A massive leak, more than 11 million records, is shedding light on how dark money flows through the global financial system. These types of offshore entities have been used for decades. Her involvement with terrorist organizations or authoritarian regimes in North Korea and Syria. Over the last decade, the largest international banks have been involved in multiple scandals. One name embodies the excesses of this renegade finance, HSBC. No matter where you live, no matter what kind of business you are in, if you wish to enter the offshore system, HSBC is likely to be your bank. Il y a à la fois l'argent de la drogue, à la fois l'argent du terrorisme, à la fois l'argent des diamantaires belges, à la fois l'argent du Gotha, du showbiz. From Geneva to Hong Kong, from New York to Paris, this financial empire has created a unique network to move dirty money around the world. HSBC is considered one of the best money laundering institutions globally. From tax evasion to money laundering for the mafia and manipulation of currency, HSBC has its hands in a variety of illicit activities. Affiliates of drug cartels were literally walking into bank branches with hundreds of thousands, sometimes millions of dollars of U.S. cash. Often pursued, but never condemned. How many billions of dollars do you have to launder for drug lords before somebody says, we're shutting you down? HSBC enjoys unbelievable impunity and continues to earn more profits. Normally, this bank would have been closed down. They would have lost their license to operate. HSBC a été de tous les scandales. Au moment où le cœur de la finance internationale se déplace vers l'Asie, la grande question c'est quel est son prochain coup? HSBC stands for Hong Kong and Shanghai Banking Corporation. In Hong Kong, it is simply called the bank. It's here that HSBC was born and where it makes the bulk of its profits. It is the most Chinese of Western banks or the most European of Chinese banks. For new Chinese billionaires, it serves as a hub to invest their fortunes. To the rest of the world, it offers a whole range of top-of-the-line financial services. This place is likely to attract a lot of dirty money. This is a highly secretive jurisdiction, but it's also a huge financial entrepreneur obviously, with such a large Chinese market and so on, it's a very big offshore financial center. That combination of scale of operation and scale of secrecy makes it one of the world's biggest and, in our opinion, one of the greatest threats to the global financial markets. In April 2016, a handful of investigative journalists unveiled a treasure 11 million confidential documents that revealed the operations of a law office specializing in tax evasion. This became the Panama Papers scandal. From this black box of money laundering, two key players emerge, Hong Kong and the bank HSBC. We knew this was a major go-to bank for individuals and for companies who wish to benefit 
from the secrecy that the offshore system provided. So I or one of my colleagues searched the Panama Papers database with the term HSBC and you saw thousands of results, thousands of emails, thousands of Excel documents, thousands of Word documents that in some way were discussing HSBC's role in this offshore system. An incredible number of Chinese residents, businessmen and women, and of course many family members associated with leading Communist Party figures who appeared in the Panama Papers and who often used Hong Kong as a conduit to the offshore world. They're not the kind of clients who walk in on a bright Tuesday morning to draw a check or to make a deposit. I just shake my head at much of what I see. Hong Kong doesn't have currency controls at its border. You know, if you can get the money out of China, you can fill up an 18-wheel truck and, and drive the cash in. Nobody's going to ask you to declare that. As a former undercover agent working within the money laundering networks of drug cartels, Bill Masher is now working for the Chinese government. He tracks the flow of illegal money leaving the country. The two largest acts of money laundering that I'm aware of in Hong Kong in the last eight, nine years led to the conviction of a 65-year-old illiterate village woman who laundered uh, in cash about uh, one billion US. It's a huge amount for a little old illiterate woman to be coming in all the time, dropping off $30 million in physical cash. And, and this or that. The next person of note who brought in $13 billion in physical cash was a high school dropout who used to drive across a truck across the border from Guangdong every day with about 50 million. How can that much money move into a system and nobody but the straw men, the dumbest two in it, get jail time? I don't have an idea of how much money is going out of China. We don't keep track of the source of the money in Hong Kong, whether it's from China, whether it's from India, from Singapore, from Japan. That has always been the case and that will continue to be the case. Laura Cha is the face of the Manhattan of Asia. She also embodies the obscurity of this financial center. Close to the Chinese leaders with whom she once worked as a stock market control agent, she now advises the Hong Kong government while serving on the board of HSBC. What was the impact of the Panama Papers in Hong Kong? It was an item, a headline for a few days. I don't think anybody was talking about the Panama Paper anymore. Today are days of morality. It's rather immoral to have tax evasion. There's no problem for Hong Kong companies to incorporate BVI or Cayman Island or Bermuda companies, and uh, some of these are listed on our market. And there's no problem with that? There's no problem, yeah. Mm. In Hong Kong, HSBC is untouchable. The favorite bank of the Chinese is protected by the highest authorities. It has always been one of the pillars of local power. The bank and the former colony were born at the same moment more than 150 years ago. At the time, the British crown dreamt of conquering the Chinese market that was closed to Westerners. The first settlers chose the fishing port in Hong Kong as the base for their commercial offensive. The British began trading opium, 
destined for the Chinese market. Given the success of the drug, the emperor burns the cargo of the traffickers. London sends in its military fleet and triggers the Opium War. The Chinese capitulate, and the British gain possession of Hong Kong for 99 years. The British were controlling large parts of India, where opium was grown. And basically, the British realized that opium was something that people wanted, and they realized that they had a lot of opium to offer. Right? So before opium really sort of took off, the balance of trade was in the favor of the Chinese. Once opium becomes such a big product, the balance of trade actually goes toward the British side. The opium trade has its golden age, and the settlers need a bank. They create HSBC, the Hong Kong and Shanghai Banking Corporation. The most notorious traffickers in the city, mostly Scottish, sit on the first board of directors. I would say that HSBC was not necessarily created by opium traders, but was by, created by traders who happened to be involved in opium. In Hong Kong, HSBC takes power. It prints the local currency, finances the construction of the city, and serves the interest of Her Majesty in the Far East. There were three or four great powers in, in, in that quite small place. And one, of course, was the governor, the, as, as appointed by the British government. Uh, and one was the chairman of the jockey club, uh, which was responsible for the horse racing. But a third great power was always the chairman of uh, HSBC. HSBC were always right there at the top, yes. HSBC has never changed its DNA. Formerly the Bank of Pirates, it continues to function on the dark side of finance. The only difference is, it no longer operates only in Hong Kong. The bank has become a global empire. HSBC nearly shut down. The fate of the bank was played out in the United States in 2012, four years after the outbreak of the financial crisis. We are here today to announce the filing of criminal charges against HSBC Bank for its sustained and systemic failure to guard against the corruption of our financial system by drug traffickers and other criminals and for evading U.S. sanctions law. The Minister of Justice accuses HSBC of laundering the money of the Mexican and Colombian cartels that control the trafficking of cocaine. Nearly 1 billion euros were said to have passed through its Mexican subsidiary before being recycled into the U.S. economy. Affiliates of drug cartels were literally walking into bank branches with hundreds of thousands, sometimes millions of dollars of U.S. cash in Mexico and putting it through the teller window, uh, sometimes in boxes that were specially designed to fit through the teller window. And the HSBC employees took it, they uh, deposited it, um, and gave the person a receipt, and never reported the conduct, and never stopped it. And that didn't happen once, it didn't happen twice. It happened systematically over the course of uh, about a decade. There was one occasion, uh, an individual walks into the bank with maybe 
three or four million dollars. And bank employees spent one full day counting it. <laughs> so that's just a few million. Imagine that multiplied by several hundred fold. And that's what 881 million represents. The investigation is overwhelming. Not only have bank employees worked hand in hand with criminal organizations responsible for thousands of murders, but their managers ignored all of the warning signs. Bank had been warned repeatedly and consistently by US authorities and by Mexican authorities. They also were told that they had recordings from drug lords um, that said that HSBC was the place to launder money. Well, London knew everything, and they, they just didn't care. The accusations are serious. The bank risks losing its license in the United States. The case may precipitate the fall of a company that employs 300,000 people on five continents and manages a sum of $3,000 billion. If HSBC were a country, it would be the fifth world economic power. Bank leaders travel to Washington to be auditioned by the Senate. Please stand, raise your right hand. HSBC must be rescued. Do you swear that the testimony that you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Okay. I recognize that there have been some significant areas of failure. I have said before, and I will say again, despite the best efforts and intentions of many dedicated professionals, HSBC has fallen short of our own expectations and the expectations of our regulators. And they come up before these hearings, um, and they, they're very contrite, um, and they sort of try to deflect responsibility, and then the Senate asks more questions, and they're more contrite, and they deflect more responsibility, and then the thing's over, and they talk to the media for a minute, and then it sort of blows over, and then a settlement either happens or, or it doesn't. The group has always had as a core element of its compliance policy a focus on both the letter and the spirit of laws and regulations, not just what is permissible, but what is prudent and responsible. Most of the executives that have been called before the Senate investigation committees um, have effectively dodged all of the questions fairly significantly. So from that perspective, um, the HHBC executives are almost reading from the same script uh, being directed by the same director um, as the senior executives from the American banks. The Obama administration is divided. The Department of Justice wants to set an example while the Treasury Department advocates an amicable settlement. HSBC involves the rising star of British politics, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, George Osborne. He writes a letter to his counterpart, Timothy Geithner, and to the Chairman of the Federal Reserve, Ben Bernanke, in which he defends the HSBC cause. Dear Ben, questions about HSBC's continued ability to clear U.S. dollar would risk destabilizing the bank globally, with serious implications for financial and economic stability, particularly in Europe and Asia. I am copying this letter to Treasury Secretary Geithner, with whom I have also discussed this issue. Best wishes, George Osborne. Finance Minister George Osborne put enormous political pressure on the US government. George Osborne saw this as a key part of protecting the city of London. Normally, this bank would have been closed down. They would have lost their license to operate in the United States. Two months later, the US government yields to pressure from George Osborne and the business community. HSBC escapes trial. Its leaders are spared, and the high officials of the Department of Justice keep a low profile. 
look, look, our goal here is not to bring HSBC down. It's not to cause a systemic effect on the economy. It's not for people to lose thousands of jobs. It's to... Are they too big to prosecute? Too big? I wouldn't say it's too big to prosecute. I'm not going to say that. The bank is eventually fined 2 billion euros, the equivalent of one month's profits. For an average person who hears the number, the fine is extraordinary. For the bank that is global in reach, that is making a huge amount of money, uh, the fine is a kind of parking ticket. At the end of the day, the fine is not paid by the officers and directors of the company. The fine is paid by the shareholders. So in effect, it's a parking ticket given to the wrong people. Did I feel cheated by paying the, the huge fines that uh, no, I felt angry at the regulators. I think, yes, because the amount was obscene. Come on, Alan. This is not the regulator being harsh. This is banker doing things which are abominable. Uh, listen, uh, by, when you're dealing in Mexico, for argument's sake, yes, there is a lot of drug money. And uh, it was just part of banking, you know, and, and money just got transferred around all over the world, you know. I think everyone realizes they just maybe were naive. HSBC saved its skin. The bank gives rise to a new privilege, namely that of being too big to jail. That is to say, above the law. But the refusal to send bankers to jail triggers the anger of the public. The Department of Treasury officials are put under fire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and thank you all three for being here today. You know, it, how many billions of dollars do you have to launder for drug lords and how many economic sanctions do you have to violate before someone will consider shutting down a financial institution like this? Mr. Cohen, can we start with you? For our part, we imposed on HSBC the largest penalties that we had ever imposed on any financial institution. Let, let, let me just move you along here, though, on the point, Mr. Cohen. My question is, in your opinion, how many billions of dollars do you have to launder for drug lords before somebody says, we're shutting you down? Well, Senator, the actions, and I'm sure the regulators can, can address this issue, the actions that we took in the HSBC case, we thought were appropriate in that instance. M uh, Governor Powell, perhaps you can help me out here? Sure. We don't do criminal investigation. And in the case of HSBC, we, we um, gave essentially the statutory maximum so, civil money penalties, and we gave, uh, we gave uh, uh, you know, very stringent uh, cease and desist orders, and we did what we have the legal authority I, to do. Now I'll just say here, you know, if you're caught with an ounce of cocaine, the chances are good you're going to go to jail. If it happens repeatedly, you may go to jail for the rest of your life. But evidently, if you launder nearly a billion dollars, for drug cartels and violate our international sanctions, your company pays a fine and you go home and sleep in your own bed at night, every single individual associated with this. And I just, I think that's fundamentally wrong. I uh, agree with most. The banksters, the gangster bankers, made the world's leading economic power fold, all in the name of so-called international financial stability. You have to ask, if you don't prosecute these people, who the hell are you going to prosecute? Who has jurisdiction over an institution that operates in 100 countries? Who has the responsibility for taking on that kind of criminal undertaking? HSBC is already more than a bank. It has grown in magnitude and is now as powerful as some states. This is the culmination of a strategy launched 20 years ago.
It all began in 1997. Great Britain officially hands over Hong Kong to the People's Republic of China. This marks the end of the British Empire in the Far East after a century and a half of domination. The story of this great city is about the years before this night and the years of success that will surely follow it. The bank has to choose, move with the crown or stay and be in the grip of China. HSBC decides to have it both ways. It moves its headquarters to London, but keeps the heart of its business in Hong Kong. China has just opened its borders and promises to be a fabulous market. The priority is to flatter the new masters of Beijing. They describe their brief as to create the best bank building in the world. The building was a statement of confidence. It was about stability, it was about permanence, it was a gesture of confidence in a future uh, beyond the transition of a colony into part of China. It was also making a statement about ambition. HSBC at that time was a local bank, and they have become one of the global players. The full extent of that we were only to realize later. A pioneer of globalization, HSBC intends to spread its Chinese DNA. In the early 2000s, it is the first foreign bank to establish itself in China. Its president, Stephen Green, serves as an ambassador of capitalism to the leaders of the Communist Party. Initially, we were actually advisors to Bank of China, Shanghai, to its capital. So during the process, the President of Bank of Shanghai asked me, what about your own bank? We, lo we love HSB to be part of our investor groups. So I reported back to Stephen Green, and uh, actually Stephen was uh, quite good. Stephen took a flight, went to Shanghai, together with me, had a dinner with the president of Bank of Shanghai. After dinner, he came out to say, I like this bank, and also I trust that individual. Let's do the investment. And of course, the payoff was good too. <laughs> HSBC triples its investment and pockets nearly 300 million euros. The bank extends its honeymoon with Beijing by exploiting its own history. Under the dictatorship of Mao, it was the only bank to maintain a presence in China. When the giant woke up, HSBC was already firmly in place. It was a terrific message that HSBC were able to give, to say, we were always there, we never, we never left. And it's always tried hard to compare itself with the American banks. And it takes flying, these American banks, they come and they go. We, you know, we British, we stick around and, and stay. You know, it's the Chinese philosophy, isn't it? Think long. <laughs> Once again, history will accelerate the fate of HSBC. In September 2007, the financial crisis hits the streets of London. I want to close this account at you. 
Totally cynical attitude for your customers. Panic seizes the clients of Northern Rock and threatens to spread to other banks. The British government proposes lending them money as an emergency response. HSBC snubs the meeting and refuses any public assistance. Being bailed out by the government, being given capital by the government, means that the government has influence on you. And HSBC wanted to be able to say, uh, you don't have this influence on us, we are independent, we're fine, we can recapitalize ourselves, and if you try to force us, uh, as one interlocutor told me, if you try to force us to take your money, we will take you to court and sue. You could ask, well, isn't this really arrogant? It is arrogant, but it is also the ability of the bank to signal to a government, we're a global bank, you're a single government, and so think about the relative power between us. HSBC bankers prefer to turn to their friends, Hong Kong businessmen who made their fortunes through trade with China. The bank offers to sell them 18 billion euros of shares. We knew when the bank was facing some problems, we have to help out. And, and, and uh, you know, the, the share price was very, very low at the time. Uh, and for most business people, the best thing was, why not take a share of the rights issue? And uh, those people that did, did very, very well. Did sure. you make a lot of money on that deal? Did I make a lot of money on that deal? I think that, uh, um, yes, uh, uh, normally we don't uh, uh, give out figures, but uh, it, it's, it, it was a nice, it's a nice profit. Since that transaction, the price of each share has tripled. As always, HSBC made its shareholders rich. But history will remember that for the first time, Chinese money rescued a British bank. Driven by its Chinese business, HSBC is taking advantage of the crisis. While its competitors suffer losses, it is crowned at Westminster. Its president, Stephen Green, enters the House of Lords. I, Stephen, Lord Green of Hurstbeer Point, do swear by Almighty God that I will be faithful and bear true allegiance to Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth, <coughs> her heirs and successors, according to law. So help me God. The banker, who is also a deacon, preaches the good word on Sunday at church, where he criticizes the influence of money. Lord Green was himself an upstanding member of society as well as being a moral uh, banker, if you like. So he was, a, he was the acceptable face of banking at a time when most bankers were not acceptable. Immediately after, Stephen Green entered the government as Minister of State for Trade and Investment. It was a, probably a dream come true for him, and this, of course, was at a time when the Cameron government and George Osborne, the then Chancellor, were very, very keen to build up Britain's links to Asia and to China in particular. The promotion of Stephen Green is the doing of the pro-Chinese lobby, led by the Chancellor, George Osborne. The one who saved HSBC from the American justice system. An informal pact unites the two actors. Stephen Green opens the doors of the Chinese market to British companies. And in exchange, George Osborne is committed to defending the interests of the bank and of its former president all over the world. Protected by London, blessed by Beijing, HSBC serves as a go-between for the two capitals. Who would dare attack it? In Paris, 
a senior official of the finance ministry, is waiting for his chance to go on the offensive. He's gotten his hands on HSBC's best-kept secret, the list of 100,000 customers who hold accounts in Switzerland. These documents were given to him by a former computer scientist of the bank. They reveal in detail the clandestine circuits that make it possible to clean dirty money. There's talk of 180 billion euros, more than the budget of the European Union. Pour les agents du fisc, pour les spécialistes de la finance, c'est pas quelque chose qu'on découvrait. Mais personne n'avait eu le loisir d'observer des choses qui, par nature, sont cachées ou secrètes. Et là, ce qu'on a vu apparaître, c'est quelque chose de gigantesque et industriel, avec des armées d'avocats, d'experts comptables, de cabinets conseils et tout ça. Swiss leaks. It's under this name that the world media reveals the scandal and publishes the names of fraudsters. To mafiosi, heads of state, dictators or ordinary citizens, to all its customers, HSBC offers numbered anonymous accounts and provides turnkey shell companies to evade the laws. The only condition? Customers must deposit at least 1 million euros. Il y a à la fois l'argent de la drogue, à la fois l'argent du terrorisme, à la fois l'argent des diamantaires belges, à la fois l'argent des chirurgiens dentistes français, à la fois l'argent du Gotha, du showbiz, euh, de l'aristocratie française et européenne. C'est l'argent qui vient vraiment de tous les endroits, tous les domaines possibles. Là où il y a de l'argent, il fallait à un moment donné, c'était un sport national, cacher son argent en Suisse, chez HSBC. On proposait aux gens qui, pour une raison ou une autre, voulaient garder un profil bas, on leur proposait de s'acheter une société offshore, Panama, BVI, Cayman, n'importe quoi. Toutes les banques de la place se faisaient de la concurrence. Ça, c'est absolument clair. On ne pouvait grandir que par l'apport d'argent frais. HSBC laundering is methodically organized. Clandestine operations are the subject of internal reports archived in the bank's Swiss safes. This customer forbids us to contact him in Belgium. It is always he who calls us. He comes under the name of a footballer, Zidane or Cruyff, for example, who wants to know the price of caviar, that is, the total amount of his assets. Genève, par rapport à Londres, n'était pas indépendant. Il ne faut pas croire ça. C'est clair qu'il y avait un énorme travail de coordination et de direction qui venait de Londres, puisque nous avions euh, des membres de la maison mère au conseil de, de la Banque suisse. Donc Londres était informé de ce qui se passait à Genève. After the laundering case of drug money in the United States, the revelations about the tax evasion of VIPs was more unwanted than ever. HSBC becomes public enemy number one. Even the Swiss feel obliged to intervene. A raid is organized in front of the cameras. Ici, on parle de gros dossiers, on parle de milliers de documents, on parle de quantités astronomiques de données informatiques. Pour vous dire, lorsque nous avons copié euh, les serveurs d'HSBC, il a fallu plusieurs jours pour faire tourner les appareils servant à copier les données. Donc euh, voilà, c'était euh, suffisamment important pour qu'il euh, n'y ait pas moyen, euh, techniquement même, d'effacer rapidement toutes ces données. Bah, le problème du gouvernement suisse et des autorités publiques suisses, ils sont le dos au mur. Et ils voient immédiatement les conséquences 
titanée, c'est, c'est le tremblement de terre. Eux, ils partent du principe depuis un siècle qu'ils donnent tous les éléments pour que la finance internationale vienne en Suisse, elle y trouve un nid douillet où ils pourront faire leur business sans être embêtés. The Swiss judiciary closed the investigation three months later. In exchange for its commitment to purge unwanted customers, HSBC is fined 40 million euros. After the fine imposed by the Americans, the Swiss settled for chump change. L'amende maximale qui peut être infligée euh, en droit suisse pour blanchiment d'argent est de 5 millions de francs suisses. Lorsque vous faites une négociation, il ne suffit pas d'avoir des cartes. Il y a aussi le colt que vous avez à la ceinture. Et en tant que procureur en Suisse, par rapport aux établissements financiers, euh, c'est un colt de très petit calibre. Qu'ils aient réussi à négocier ça à 40 millions, euh, c'est bien, ça prouve qu'ils ont de bons négociateurs. Je rêve d'un jour où les juges d'instruction français émettront des mandats d'arrêt internationaux contre le grand, les grands patrons des banques suisses et les obligeront à venir menoter à Paris. Alors on m'a dit, non mais veille pas comme d'habitude, il déconne, je ne déconne pas du tout. On a besoin d'honnêteté et de morale. Et il faut que les grands patrons des grandes banques qui commettent des choses comme ça viennent s'expliquer devant le peuple c'est-à-dire à la barre d'un tribunal. There will be no lawsuit against HSBC, nor the bankers at the court of law. In France and in Belgium, for example, ministers of justice prefer to negotiate. As for the Parisian official who had gotten too close to the fire, he is dismissed from the investigation. Roland Veilpeau, il est en vacances en Chine, on l'appelle, on lui dit euh, « Roland, quand tu rentres, passe me voir », c'était le directeur de relations humaines de Bercy, qui lui a dit « Écoute, là, tu es déchargé du dossier, tu pars euh, à Melun, je crois, pour devenir conservateur des hypothèques ». Ça faisait deux ans seulement qu'il était en poste. Normalement, on reste cinq ans en poste. Donc là, il a bien compris que c'était pour une raison simple, on l'avait déjà demandé avant, c'était « Arrête avec cette opération chocolat, il y a trop d'enjeux, on se fâche avec la Suisse, on se fâche avec Nicolas Sarkozy, on se fâche avec beaucoup de gens, on va passer à autre chose, on va mettre un peu le pied dessus. HSBC was saved once again. The bank is no longer just too big to jail. Its influence goes beyond the financial sphere and guarantees it complete impunity. The only concession the former president, Stephen Green, disappears from the picture. Lord Green had presided over HSBC uh, when they had acquired the Swiss branch. He knew all that. And what was particularly awful about Lord Green was, of course, that he had been appointed by uh, David Cameron to be a trade minister. I thought this was absolutely shocking, and I thought he should come and give account of himself to my committee. But this is one of the few times when politics trumped. The matter is political. Stephen Green, the former Secretary of State, can bring down David Cameron's government. Does the Prime Minister expect us to believe that in Stephen Green's three years as a minister, he never had a conversation with him about what was happening at HSBC. My responsibility is the tax laws of this country, and no one has been tougher. This government has been tougher than any previous government. That's why they're desperate. That's why they're losing. Mr. Connor Burns! Some parliamentarians refuse to bury the case and prosecute the bank. But no investigation will be launched, neither by the tax authorities nor by the British courts.
the elected officials will have to content themselves with hearing from the leaders of HSBC. And it's the turn of the new boss, Stuart Gulliver, to begin the series of auditions. So I have made substantial changes, which hopefully we'll get the chance to explain to you all. Three years after Washington, this same scenario with the same script is being replayed in London. I'd like to put on the record an apology from both myself and from Douglas for the unacceptable events that took place at our private bank in Switzerland in the mid-2000s, uh, which is clearly an apology we'd like to make to you all, to our customers, our shareholders, to the public at large. You do understand how this looks today. The example comes from up high. The manager himself received his bonuses on an account in Switzerland, managed by a ghost company based in Panama. He had family here, he was born here, he sent his children to here, uh, he worked from here, he voted here, and yet because he claimed that his residence was in Hong Kong, he didn't pay British tax. And when we asked him, why don't you pay the proper tax, his reply was quite interesting, because he said he didn't want other people in the bank to know how much he earned. So it was set up for reasons of privacy and no nefarious uh, reasons whatsoever. How much did you put into the Panama account? It was seven and a half million US dollars. Um, uh... Stuart Gulliver was one of the best paid investment bankers in the world. I think that tells you that he really cares about money. Um, Mr. Gulliver will get on a lot faster if you give a straight answer to a straight question. You agree with me, it's caused reputational damage to the bank. Yes. Are you the appropriate person in those circumstances to remain as the Chief Executive Officer of HSBC? I believe I am, because my tax affairs are in order. He said he couldn't understand why the question was so aggressive. <laughs> yeah, it, it just shows you, I suppose, that bankers of his generation who grew up as investment bankers in the pre-crisis world were living in a bubble. When they are face to face with parliamentarians, they sometimes get exposed for living in those bubbles. Has Gulliver changed? I don't think Stuart Gulliver can fundamentally change. One of the ministers once said to me in a corridor in the middle of these hearings, do you realize that what you're doing is putting them off from coming to the UK. And I laughed, because I thought he was uh, joking. And then I realized he was serious. The Swiss leak scandal was the last chance to sanction HSBC's practices. The authorities preferred to delegate to the bank the power to control itself. It has since recruited 9,000 people tasked with identifying suspicious transactions and to denounce them internally. Case closed. The banksters say that they've changed. I've been involved in financial market regulation for decades. I've heard this, ah, oh, that was in the past, that was 10 years ago. Now, 10 years ago, I heard HSB saying that was in the past. And yet scandals that have emerged show that well, their claims 10 years ago were hollow. At this stage, I don't believe it. I do not believe that they've cleaned their act up. People talk about it as being a massive oil tanker. You can't change direction very easily. Are we capable of regulating the banks properly? Of course we are. Do we want to is uh, the really probably important question. The British government has turned the page. It has other priorities. And HSBC has other ambitions. China needs its services. Beijing wants to set out to conquer the world.
the end of 2015, the Chinese President Xi Jinping arrives in London. The United Kingdom unrolls the red carpet and celebrates the Sino-British friendship with great fanfare. Your visit to the United Kingdom marks a milestone in this unprecedented year of cooperation and friendship between the United Kingdom and China. As we celebrate the ties between our two countries and prepare to take them to ambitious new heights. The century of China has begun, and HSBC changes masters. The former bank of the traders of opium, formerly in the service of Her Majesty, now operates under China. It must help the communist regime realize its dream, to become in turn a giant of the financial world. La Chine a les moyens de ses ambitions. C'est le banquier du monde. Elle dispose des plus grandes réserves en devises, que ce soit en dollars, en euros, en yens, en francs suisses. Mais ce sont les monnaies des autres, elle ne les contrôle pas. Et c'est pourquoi elle entend imposer sa propre monnaie, qui est le yuan, dans la cour des grands. Elle a 20 ans devant elle pour arriver à cet objectif. What they really want is a world in which the dollar isn't so dominant. And so in that sense, London can play, as it is doing, an important role in the trading of Chinese currency, the RMB, and a big role for Chinese involvement in international finance. To dethrone the dollar king, China must have its currency, the yuan, accepted as the currency of reference in international trade. Beijing lags behind others. Its currency of the people is virtually unknown in the markets. HSBC is one of the world's leading foreign exchange houses, and HSBC has a very strong position in the currency markets in Hong Kong as well as London. And as a result, HSBC is a very natural bridge between China and the city. HSBC is the first foreign bank to convert the Chinese currency. The great works of the Silk Road, finance in Yuan, HSBC is making its next move to become the pipeline of Chinese capital invested in London. 40 years after the oil dollars of the Gulf, it's the billions coming from Beijing that make the city's mouth water. And it's the finance minister, George Osborne, HSBC's best friend, who is still wielding the controls. More trade and more investment with China means more business and more jobs for Britain. The minister has especially relaxed the regulations to accommodate Chinese capital. It is the last stage of a high-risk policy that opens the doors of international markets to a financial world led by Beijing. La finance chinoise est totalement différente de la finance occidentale que nous connaissons. D'abord, elle n'est pas soumise aux mêmes impératifs de transparence et aux exigences de réglementation. Ensuite, elle est à la solde du Parti communiste chinois dont elle sert les intérêts politiques. Et enfin, parallèlement à cette finance chinoise officielle dont on ne connaît rien, il existe une finance parallèle totalement opaque, totalement informelle, sans trace, qui est constituée d'une nébuleuse de dettes et de prêts. 
c'est la finance de l'ombre qui constitue un péril potentiel pour l'économie occidentale. As you have firms of the stature and the size of HSBC marrying up with rising Chinese banks that are, are now so huge, yeah, it's a, it's a recipe for, for, for potential disaster. Ten years after the crisis, financial stability is an illusion. By helping China become the world's banker, HSBC has created a new threat. So far, Beijing has always managed to contain its financial crises within its borders. But today, the banksters have taken down the firewalls. And with the first spark, the fire will spread to the West. And in the face of the impotence of the states, it is again the people who will pay the bills.